Hello and welcome to a special two-part note in which we're going to be discussing this book, Emerging Markets in an Upside Down World, which is a, an aggressive treatise suggesting that we're treating the whole way we go about investing in emerging markets the wrong way round, possibly even upside down. It's written by a man who is uh, long known as one of the foremost evangelists for emerging markets investing during his long career at Ashmore Investment Management. Now on his own at his new venture, New Sparta, let's talk to Jerome Booth. Jerome, Hello, John. Thanks for joining me today. Now, your main point that you want to make it for the first half of this book, as I understand it, is basically that our whole financial perception is wrong, that there is an intellectual failure at work here. Tell me what you... Well, what, what is your problem with the way the model works? Finance right? theory is quite a new subject. Mm. And as an economist, um, you know, economic, economics has got its problems as well. And yeah. I, think, I think it's really an issue about the limits to the, to, to the sort of problems that finance theory, theory tries to answer. Thinking in particular of CAPM and the notion of an efficient frontier. That's, that's a very good example. CAPM, uh, you know, the, the logic behind that was demonstrated in 1977 by Richard Roll to be mm. really um, uh, not true. It's a circular argument. And yet we still use it. We still use it. And mm. we have big misconceptions about things like risk. Um, right, let's we start. We've got one very basic, very important demonstration mm -hmm. of this is the, the dollar yes. itself, arguably the linchpin of the entire world financial system. Not necessarily the most stable of linchpins. No, I think we, because we have this denominator of uh, seeing everything in terms of the dollar, um, mm. we observe markets which perhaps uh, see you know, other currencies go up and down versus the dollar. And we get very worried because they all sometimes seem to be correlated, mm. in both developed and developing currencies. Uh, this volatility seems to be correlated. And actually, there's a different way of looking at the problem, which is to say, well, maybe it's because the dollar is volatile. Right. Um, the other point about this graph is that it shows, I think, reasonably clearly that the dollar is not a lot stronger than it was. Right. Another interesting point is just in 08, and I would point here to the history of uh, the beginning of, of the First World War in 1914. Uh, the dollar actually went down, and sterling and um, uh, the French franc rallied very strongly. Which wasn't a bet that the, the, the British and the French were about to win no, the war. No, it's, it it's actually not a flight to quality. It's what I call a flight to liabilities. It's when you've got a really big problem in your country, but a lot of uh, people in that country have investments overseas, they tend to pull them back home, and that can actually increase the currency in the short term. So a lot of the um, explanations of markets that we see um, uh, in, 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 in the press, in markets, uh, are actually stories made up to fit the data. And a lot of the time, we really fundamentally don't know what's going on, partly because we don't understand the big global imbalances, right. but also because we've got a problem with the theory. And one of the big problems with the theory is that we, as I said, we misinterpret risk. Risk is a much abused word. Right. We Let let's quickly, we've got yeah. one interesting chart on this. Sorry to interrupt you in mid-flow. Yeah. Uh, Ten-year bond yields, the yeah. again, uh, if the dollar isn't the linchpin of the world financial system, then yeah. the 10-year tre treasury certainly is are far, far, far more volatile than emerging market bonds on this basis. Yes. Take us through again. This rather upends our notion of I, what is risky and what yes. isn't risky. Yes. I mean, the idea that there is something risky and something that's risk-free, yes. the, the term risk-free is an abuse of language. There's yeah. no such thing. Right. The real difference is that people perceive there to be risk in emerging markets, maybe over-perceive it, but they don't perceive the risk in the developed world. If you get away from just equating volatility mm. with risk, and you actually realize that for most investors that are investing their own money as opposed to other people's, and that don't have a, a, an attention span of, of half a minute or right. a day or two, um, then actually large permanent loss might be more important than a bit of volatility. And what I would like is right. to get away from the simple idea that if I can't measure it doesn't exist, uh, which is kind of where our finance theory is, is at the moment, to trying to reincorporate macroeconomics, politics, history, a lot of the other things that we know. So we know that the dollar you know, is, is actually historically v pretty variable. We know that the average um, over the last six decades uh, yield on yeah. the 10-year Treasury is 6%. And if the Treasury yield goes to 6% again, a lot of people holding Treasuries are going to have you know, up to a third of their portfolio wiped out. So that's hardly a risk-free right. asset. You concentrate the, you look at right. the asset concentration as well. The fact that people um, uh, should look at the structure of the investor base, and because that is crucial to determining. Well, I liquidity mean, aren't there some fairly limited investor bases uh, in in, uh, in the emerging world, though? I mean, the the, the the total book of people who are who have lent money to some of the the smaller emerging markets can't be that diverse. I uh, think. 
Well, absolutely, I would disagree with that. I think uh -huh. some of, there are three, if you like, ingredients, a cocktail, I call it, a yeah. triple cocktail for systemic blow-ups. One is a misperception of risk, and I'm arguing very strongly that the biggest misperceptions are in the developed world. Where, where you think it's safe but it isn't is exactly. far more dangerous than when you yes. think it's dangerous and it isn't. Yes, Carrying, yes. yes. Sure. Secondly, where you have a homogenous investor base. In other words, a lot of people doing the same thing, and that's definitely uh, uh, increased by financial repression, which is currently happening in the developed world as a response sure. to, to high debt. And did help shower money, particularly between 01 and 07, into the, yes. the brick economies, as Goldman Sachs well, did. Well, no, no, the, them, the financial yes. repression is any government policy yeah. which captures domestic savings in order to fund their own domestic yeah. government. So that's what the low interest rate QE policy is doing in the developed mm. world. Then, then, in addition to that, if you've got those two things, uh, plus leverage, be it at the economy-wide level or in the asset class, even worse, then you have the possibility of blow-ups. So what you've got in the emerging world is you've got a much lower level of debt. You have um, an over-perception of the risk rather than the, the problem the other way around. And you also have a much more diverse investor base. So you have uh, you know, nearly 70 countries just in the emerging debt index. These are all very, very different economies. Not only that, I mean, a lot of the bigger ones are actually closed. You know, what happens in Brazil is essentially a Brazilian problem caused by Brazilian policies and it's Brazilian not economies. as open an economy. It's as got, you know, the, the idea of blaming QE for Brazil's problems is a bit like complaining about the weather when it's raining. Get your umbrella and, you know, cope with it. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't bad weather, but it's a minor problem right. compared to the structural problems in Brazil itself. OK, Jerome, thank you very much indeed. I think we have already come up, therefore, with a, a fairly strong notion that perhaps we do need to turn our ideas of risk upside down. Next time, we're going to talk about what we might actually, therefore, do about it. Might be a little more tricky. Join us then.